morning. So this talk is about the web, but more about the culture of the web, not the science of the web. Um, most of us who work with the web these days, much of what we do is not so much about science, but about the cultural aspects of it. And big projects like the Apollo program, they have side effects. Uh, they have accidental things that are created when you put lots of very bright people together. And the Apollo program gave us Velcro, which is amazing, but nothing like as amazing as what CERN gave us, which I would argue is the most important development since Gutenberg. It was the web. It's affected everyone on Earth. To clarify that the web is not the internet, the web is everything you do in a browser. And the things you do um, that aren't the web are email, but that can be in the web now. So uh, anything you can do in a browser is the web. And the web was really the, the killer app. It was the catalyst that fueled the massive explosion of the internet. The internet started to grow just before the web was developed, but really, as soon as you had a browser, you had a way to massively scale what was going on on the internet. And that happened here. And on the left is Ben Siegel, who was the guy that brought the internet to CERN. He brought TCP IP here. And then in the middle and on the right, you have Robert Cayo and, and uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who were responsible for actually making it happen. But the machine itself, the first web server, was really what created the connection to where the, web, the action and the web really went afterwards uh, to Silicon Valley. That machine was what Steve Jobs built after he was kicked out of Apple, and it was his dream machine, if you like. But only 50,000 of those were ever made. And to put that into perspective, last week Apple sold 9 million iPhones. So this machine, which is what built the web, what built the whole of Apple, was something that was incredibly rare and incredibly special. And that culture, when it went to the West Coast, obviously, had something very different from what people would normally associate with what happens when uh, a scientific development becomes a giant business. And, um, but that's only part of the story. This is the, the popular myth, if you like, because actually what happens in Silicon Valley is you have a mixture of former military bases, like Hewlett-Packard, which was built in a former military base, a uh, massive organization, and a sprinkling of counterculture. And that's, that, that, that's what makes things happen. But the best way to get a, a handle on the qualitative aspect, the, the cultural aspect of the web, is probably to look at quantitative things, to look at numbers. So in a second, 2.8 million emails are now sent. In a minute, nearly 700,000 Google searches. In an hour, 10.5 million pictures are uploaded to Facebook. And in a year, 98 years' worth of YouTube video are uploaded. These are gigantic numbers. But actually, you can still see that email is still very big, even though the vast majority of it is spam. So since the development of the web, an amazing thing has happened, which is the majority of all of the words, images, and videos that have ever been produced were produced in a little over the last year. In fact, 90% of all the words, images, and moving pictures ever produced by human beings were produced in the last two years. And we don't know what to do with that. That's what we talk about when we talk about big data, is basically information overload for machines. We don't know how to process it. Most of what's on the web is actually not uh, scientific research. Most is porn, shopping, or travel. The majority of data is video, and by 2017 it will be two-thirds of all data. The majority of pictures are of naked women, and the majority of email, 81%, is spam. But to get a handle on how big this data is, we need to create a unit of measure. Um, a unit of measure um, that's meaningful. So the Library of Congress has 29 million books in it. Um, if we were to create one unit as being 29 million books, um, that would be about 10 terabytes of data. And what does that mean? Well, that means that now the fastest connections on the internet can move the Library of Congress every half an hour. It means that the amount of internet that's put on the web is equivalent of two and a half thousand Library of Congresses every single day. 34% of human beings are on the web and 17% of human beings are on Facebook. And 14% of humans watch an average of four hours of YouTube videos a month. On Twitter alone, Obama has the kind of following that is the population of a, a major country but actually Lady Gaga has more with 40 million. 
And the, big, the most watched ever video, which has been watched 1.7 billion times, if, you were, if one person was to watch that back to back, they'd have to sit in front of a screen for 16,000 years. One in eight married couples met online, and this actually is probably a figure that's much higher now. After the web was created and it moved to Silicon Valley, a billion dollar company was created every single three months. Apart from, there was a brief period in 2000 to 2002 after the dot-com crash when it didn't happen, but pretty much since 1998 to now, a billion dollar company created every single three months. In 2008, the number of things connected to the internet exceeded human beings. And this year, the number of mobile internet devices exceeded the number of human beings on Earth. And this picture really uh, sums it up for me. The, two pope, the inauguration of two popes, only a few years apart. In the top, you can see one person's holding a camera phone. In the bottom, that's our new reality. Every single major event is basically a cluster of screens, like a million candles being held up. So if we look at specific sectors um, that are affecting everyday life, the biggest one is obviously privacy. We have a communication medium now that's many to many. And in New the New York Magazine in 2007 wrote an article that was considered to be the defining summary of what the big change to culture was because of the internet. Uh, they were saying that uh, there was a difference between old and young people that was as big as the difference... Uh, when rock and roll first appeared. And it was that young people, by default, considered what they did to be public. They didn't really think about it. Um, well, actually, that's not true, because only a few years later, the exact opposite's happening. Young people are very concerned with their privacy. If you actually look at the graph in the top right, the left-hand side are young people. They're far more likely to be uh, concerned with security than older people. And you have applications like Snapchat, which literally cover their tracks. You upload a picture, you set a time, and it self-destructs. Primarily used by young people. Obviously, um, it's become a big issue, privacy, very recently. Um, but to use our unit of measure, our Library of Congress measure, how much data is being processed by government? Well, the NSA process a Library of Congress worth of data every six hours. And that's created activist privacy groups who are really aware of the issues. China is aware of the issues and realizes that actually people care more about cute cats than activism. So they built their own social networks, which Ethan Zuckerman said was a cute cat theory of social activism, where they realized that if you want to stop people um, being activists, what you should do is build your own social networks, control them by the government, let people have cute cats and then um, control the activist sites. But obviously the activism continues, and the Arab Spring was really the, the moment where people claimed that culture was really being affected by the internet, that social networks were actually uh, a, a process by which revolution could happen. It was slightly overplayed, but it's still a factor. But this may not always be benign, because democracy can be mob rule, and a very worrying study has emerged from a study of Chinese social networks, which has shown pretty much that hatred spreads much more quickly on social networks and positive feelings. In a way, that's obvious. That's like the second law of thermodynamics in physics. This is it applied to the way people talk. Of course, bad, bad things spread. And Clay Shirky, uh, a New York researcher, said that what people tend to do is they share things they like, but they comment on things they hate. And we've seen in Europe um, a major situation since 2008 where jobs uh, for young people particularly um, have created massive unemployment and potentially massive civil unrest. And the internet plays uh, a really big role here, a role that people I don't think have acknowledged quite how dramatic that is. To put it in perspective, Google employs about 50,000 people. That's about the number of students at the University of Vienna. If Google employed the same number of people for per, per value, per market cap, as, let's say, a supermarket, let's say a Carrefour, then uh, Google would actually have to employ the same number of people as the whole population of Austria. 
And even the online supermarkets don't employ the same number of people. Amazon last year didn't declare a profit because it bought Kiva. They own everything. They own the robots that operate their warehouses. Kiva for three quarters of a billion dollars are the little orange things you see under these racks. That's how their warehouses are operated. Anything from travel agents to bookshops to camera shops, taxi companies, realtors, these things are going away. Because the internet fundamentally makes information flow, and most middlemen businesses, of which retail is one, are about imperfect flow of information. So when you increase the flow of information, that business goes away. After the 2008 crash in the UK, one in six shops are still, em still empty. Uh, the government report says that these things are coming back, don't worry, it was just a recession. Actually, they're not coming back. And we really need to look at town planning and how town centers are going to look like when there's just not as much retail in them. So obviously the physical environment is being affected. And one of the biggest changes to the, to the development of the internet beyond mobile is where everything is connected to the internet. That includes your dog's collar, plants, lampposts, everything. That's called the Internet of Things, where everything becomes a telemetry device. But actually, there's a dark side to that, and that dark side to it will probably prevent this from being quite as big as the optimists think, which is we're now creating systems that are so complex they're beyond our control. We don't know what the secondary effects of them are, and we know that from the Stuxnet virus, which was a virus built by the U.S., and the Israelis to attack Iranian centrifuges has now unleashed an arms race where potentially people could plant things that are connect in physical devices that we just don't know what will happen. They could suddenly compromise systems 10 years, in, t in 10 years' time. So I actually think that the biggest change to society will come from money on the Internet. The reason for that is that money is actually a belief system. It has to sit outside the system it represents, and it only creates value if it moves. It is a virtual network. Money itself is like an imaginary pile of gold in orbit around the Earth. And at the moment, we have, for retail banking, certainly something which, in the US, looks crazy. Why are we actually signing pieces of paper? This is clearly uh, not the way forward. But most of the development, actually, with retail online banking, with consumer banking, is in Africa. Uh, in Kenya, two-thirds of the adult population use mobile payments. And um, that's largely because mobile is growing much faster in Africa than anywhere else. Asia slowly creeping up, but within the next two years, Asia, Asia will be growing faster than Africa. But certainly Africa is showing what happens uh, when an infrastructure isn't controlled by very big organizations. And in Somaliland, which is a breakaway state from Somalia, uh, arguably has a more sophisticated electronic payment system than the U.S. But the biggest change is actually the way the network looks. We now have a spider's web and not a family tree. Several thousand years of history have been built on the bottom model. China and France, their entire economic systems are built on the bottom model. They're built on the hierarchy. We now have, as you start to allow people to talk to each other, you can draw lines between the, the bottom bits here to the top, and it becomes more like a spider's web. And obviously that has a massive impact for the way money and lending happens. It happens through networks that are much more similar to what people like Grameen were doing in developing countries. So that's based on, a coupled with a fundamental change to economics. For, for most of economics is based on supply and demand, where the supply was scarce. You couldn't produce enough food to eat. Some people starved. And suddenly you have electronic information where there's unlimited supply. So something like Spotify there's un unlimited supply, and what's scarce actually is our attention. So you will now have companies who are competing for people's attention. We take all this back to physics. What does all that information mean to show that this is really just to show the difference in scales of physics to what we perceive of as information? Well, if we were actually to say that information is real, if, if you store information on an electron, it, it uh, has a higher energy state, and therefore mass being equivalent to energy, it actually weighs more, you could actually estimate how much the entire internet weighs, this universe. Well, it weighs about two trillionths of an ounce. So it's a, a particle. It's the tiniest particle. 
It's a universe in a grain of sand. And that universe was triggered by a creation in a room here that's about 300 meters from where you're sitting. It's a room that technically sits in France. It has a Swiss phone number and Swiss socket. Um, and so it's an amazing thing that this technology, which, def which has created a world which defies boundaries, you can say exactly where that room is, but you can't actually say what country it's in. And when we ask why we should spend money on high-energy physics experiments that cost billions, what's the use? Even the byproduct changed the world. Even if there are hundreds of other contributions to, to human knowledge that happened here from medical imaging, to all sorts of other things, hadn't happened, with the web, it would still have been worth it. And that's a wonderful thing. Thank you. If anyone has any questions? Uh, sure, I'll put it on my blog. Or, yeah, I'll tweet it. Yeah. Thank you.